This is Rakesh from Shrinivasa Farms. So in the series of the webinar from last webinar, uh, we are having now second webinar on disease challenges uh, on IB and mycoplasma. So we have two speakers, uh, Dr. Sachi and Dr. Greve. Uh, so we'll start with the first uh, presentation on the IB, uh, how to prevent it, what are the control measures. Over to you, Dr. Sachi. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Stacia Ginger. I think many of you have not met me before. I currently am the technical manager of Southeast Asia. So I base out of Bangkok and I cover um, most of the Southeast Asia area, Australia, New Zealand. And hopefully um, I'll be able to make some visits to India in the future. So uh, with that, I'll kind of get started and share my screen here. So let me know when you can see my yeah, presentation. See. Okay. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna talk this morning a little bit about the prevention and control of infectious bronchitis virus. Um, hopefully you're all familiar with what this disease is, but we're gonna go through a little bit about it first. So to start off with, the etiology of uh, coronavirus or infectious bronchitis virus is it, it is an avian coronavirus, um, which is a gamma coronavirus. Now, the reason I want to make that clear is because it has no relation at all to SARS-CoV-2, which is currently what's running around and causing uh, COVID-19 in people. So COVID-19 is a beta coronavirus, and the coronavirus we're going to talk about today is a gamma coronavirus. To make it easy, um, we'll just refer to it as bronchitis. This is an enveloped RNA virus, and there are multiple serotypes and genetic types out there that are complicated by really high potential for mutation and reassortment, making it unique to avian species. So as far as we know, the avian coronaviruses are the ones that have such rapid mutation and change, and that doesn't actually happen in coronaviruses and other species. So it's a little bit unique in that effect. So this is what those uh, particles look like. So you can see, I think if I get a little pointer, you can see this black area here is the envelope protein. And that's actually really important because envelopes on a virus allow them to be very easily killed. So when we talk about certain viruses or certain infections that we really want to focus on cleaning and wash down with soaps and good detergents, it's because they have this envelope on them. And when we break this envelope down, you can see then you just expose your RNA on the inside and this kills the virus. So things like bronchitis viruses are really easy to kill if we wash properly. Now the other part that is really interesting is these little kind of almost golf tees that look like they're coming off. Those are called spike proteins. And in avian coronaviruses like infectious bronchitis virus, that's the part that any of our vaccines actually are trying to target. So it's this little spike right here that makes each one of them unique and different in responding to the bird. So how does it transmit? Well, in this case, it's actually a lot like coronaviruses that we see in people. They're highly infectious. It has rapid spread. So almost 100% of your house is gonna be sick very, very quickly. The incubation time is quite short, only 18 to 36 hours, and all ages of birds can be affected. So this could happen from the third day that pullets have arrived to your farm or any time later in life in the middle of life. It's also aerosol, which is an airborne transmission, as well as fomite, which are objects transmission. So again, all the same kind of things that we're talking about to protect ourselves from coronaviruses that are, are coronavirus that's currently going around, like wearing masks, like being very clean about what we bring into our homes. All those same things apply to infectious bronchitis virus when we're talking about our poultry. So tissue tropism. Tissue tropism is a, is a fancy way of saying, where does this virus like to live once it gets in the birds. So the primary sites it likes to go are up here in the upper respiratory tract, and it gets into the sinuses, which are here by the nose. It gets into the conjunctiva, which is the tissue around the eye, and it really likes the trachea, which is also called the windpipe, which runs down here. 
And then once it comes in through the upper respiratory system, it's going to affect our air sacs down here and also our lungs. Um, so many of you may remember from uh, your younger days of schooling, the birds have air sacs and air sacs are really what come in here and then push air forward through the lungs. So they don't have a diaphragm like you or I that they use to push air in and out of the lungs. They use these air sacs instead. So those are our primary predilection sites and why we think of infectious bronchitis virus as a respiratory disease. Uh, but bronchitis also has a few other syndromes that we recognize as being a little bit unique. The first one is that it affects the oviduct, and then it also does affect the kidneys. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So clinical signs. Well, clinical signs are gonna relate directly to which tissues were affected, right? So wherever the virus is gonna go, it's gonna replicate in those cells and cause some damage and destruction, which makes sense then that the clinical signs we see are gonna be related to those damaged sites. That being said, Obviously, if we have all these upper respiratory and lower respiratory areas, we're going to see symptoms like watery eyes, like sneezing and rails. So you can see over here, there's a lot going on in the eyes here. There's a lot of discharge coming out of the nose. And the bird generally looks sick, which is going to give us this decreased feed intake. One tricky thing of this particular virus, though, is that we may also see nothing. And this is especially true of pullets that are less than three weeks old when they're infected. So even though we're hoping to see some of these clinical signs, it may be a light enough infection that we're not gonna see anything. In layers, the same kind of things persist. You have a decreased feed intake. When they don't feel well, they don't eat. You get watery eyes, sneezing, rails. And then um, now you're gonna start to see a lot of the oviduct impact, which is the wrinkled eggs and poor shell quality. You're gonna see some watery albumin in many of the eggs that you break open, a drop in production, and um, while I know there aren't very many brown egg laying birds in India, if you were to come across some pigmented egg laying birds, you would see a loss of pigmentation in those colored eggs. So they would go from being a darker brown or a tinted color to having uh, more eggs that are white. So silent infection in pullets is really one of the areas that we try to fight against the most. Um, and why protection is so important, because you can have this early bronchitis infection that's gonna come and go before they're even three weeks old, but you cause problems that are gonna show up 20 weeks later in life that you weren't prepared for. And those two primary areas of damage that we discuss from early bronchitis infection are false layer syndrome and then kidney damage with uh, proceeding gout. So false layers, they are gonna look and act like laying birds. Their pelvic bones are gonna be wide open. So when you go and check the back of the bird to see if she's laying, it's gonna feel like she's in production. She's gonna have combs and waddles that look like she's in strong production. All of those secondary sex characteristics are there. But she's gonna have no egg production at all. What happened is you get an irreversible damage of the oviduct, but an active ovary. So you can see here, it's not patent and connected, it's completely damaged. So this is the oviduct where these eggs are supposed to come down and come out. But her ovary itself still looks normal. And it's this ovary which is giving her those secondary sex characteristics like the nice bright red comb and waddles and good progression. Another symptom you may see is this really large cystic oviduct. And we'll look more at that in a minute. Um, but what we think is happening the suspected pathogenesis, it hasn't been proven 100% yet, but we've got several research projects going on it across the scientific community, is that we think the bronchitis virus is actually affecting the development of the oviduct during early infections. And so what's going on is during the post-embryonic development of the kidneys and oviduct between one to three weeks of age, this virus is coming in and destroying a lot of those cells that are differentiating, and then that's creating problems. So they never develop correctly, but we don't ever see the result of that until they're much, much older. So this is some more pictures of what these birds may look like when you see them on your laying farms. You can see a bird, she looks like she's in lay here, but she maybe looks like she's a little bit fat and close to the ground. You can definitely see it more here. And when you cut her open, you know, nine times out of 10, you're going to see this huge cystic oviduct. So she's not going to be laying any eggs for you, but she's going to look like she is, again, because of this uh, ovary that's ready to go. So here's another photo of what those look like. They're pretty obvious when you cut into them. 
So damage and infection to the kidneys. So again, because that oviduct and kidney potentially are infected very early in life um, during the post-embryonic development phase, you're gonna have kidney problems and renal problems essentially for the rest of the bird's life. And in adult hens that have a previous tissue damage, this can really allow for a secondary bacterial infection to come in and create a big mess. So you can see the kidney here, there's a lot of white material and misshapen areas, and this is actually a full-blown infection, um, not just urate accumulation. And that's caused by early damage to the renal system, and then later bacteria settle out in there and kind of take advantage. So the other things you might see with gout, I believe these are some 22-week-old uh, pullets in, or I guess laying hens now, in India that Dr. Ian Rubinoff saw uh, this last spring. And you can see a really large plug of white running here along the kidney, and that's backup of urates in the ureter that's so intense um, that it's filled the entire section. And that's from that early renal damage. And then in the same picture, same bird rather, you can see the heart is covered with this white chalky material. So the heart's there here and over here. And that chalky material is actually visceral gout, which is a buildup of urates on other tissues in the body because they can't be cleared. So clinical signs in your older birds. Uh, again, upper respiratory signs are possible, especially if you have a secondary bacterial infection, which can be quite common in adult laying hens, especially when you have something like a bronchitis or a Newcastle that comes in early. But oftentimes we don't really see those upper respiratory signs. What we're gonna see is egg-related signs. It's probably the first thing you'll notice. So that egg-related sign you're gonna see most likely first or notice first is gonna be a big drop in egg production. So this is an old research project out of 1985. Um, so I'm not as worried about the vaccination pieces of it. What is, I think, the most important part to note is this red line here are birds that were not vaccinated against a bronchitis virus and then were challenged with a MASS-41 strain. And you can see this is the days of production or this is their production amount before they were challenged. And then at challenge, it just drops dramatically, bottoms out. This, particular flock went all the way down to 10%, and then slowly over the next several weeks, rose back up. So it's pretty typical of what you're gonna see for bronchitis viruses. You're gonna drop very quickly in egg production, um, but you will eventually recover. This is what those eggs are gonna look like. So this is a wrinkled egg. You can see the shell is really rough. It has an odd shape to it. It's not totally appropriate, and it just is not a high quality egg. In brown birds, again, you see that same wrinkling of the shell. And then if you look back behind, you can see what I was talking about earlier for the loss of pigmentation. All of these eggs should be a nice dark brown color. And instead we have an array of whites, of lighter pink eggs and some brown that exists. So this is what you'll see on a pigmented farm. And then last, if you wanna look at these cracked open eggs here, you can see some of them have a decent albumin right there, more normal, right? A little bit more normal here but these all have this watery, runny albumin. It's hard to see. There's a big spread on the egg after you crack it open. And those are all really typical of a bronchitis infection. So why does this happen? Uh, what is actually going on to create these shell effects? And it's that damage to the tissue of the bronchitis virus in each of these areas. So when you're having an effect on the ovary, by viral damage, you're getting a loss of egg numbers. I can't produce as much if my ovary itself is damaged. In the magnum, as the egg is gonna pass down, this is where you're gonna get your albumin stiffness and it's where you're gonna apply your shell membranes. And so what happens is this tissue in here is damaged. It's not working from, like, correctly. And so you have watery albumin addition and you have a wrinkled shell membrane that actually goes on. And then as we get all the way down into the uterus or the shell gland, this is going to be damaged as well and so you may not get the same shell thickness it may be incomplete you might have a completely defective calcification and then you're also going to have the resulting reduced pigmentation as that is passing through the tract as well so i love this slide um, i stole this from dr greaves it is a beautiful side that just kind of brings all of that together in summary uh, and so you can see the spread and route, again, is gonna be aerosol, contact with any sort of other, those respiratory or ocular exudates, just like they tell us, don't touch your nose, don't touch your eyes, and then um, make sure you wash your hands, right? And so after it comes in via the upper respiratory system, it's gonna to spread to our oviduct and kidneys. 
and it really has some problems with persistence on multi-age slaying farms, which we'll talk about. This virus is not vertically transmitted, which means it is not going to come in from your parent birds to your commercial birds, and it's not gonna go from your grandparent birds to your parent stock. So they only get it from each other, not from their parents through the egg. Morbidity is 100%. Every bird is gonna get sick, and again, it's gonna happen very quickly. They were fine yesterday, and they come in today, and all the birds look a little bit off. Mortality is variable depending on the strain. There are some strains that are very hot, um, QX was one that was very, very hot when it first showed up and killed a tremendous amount of birds. And certainly in broilers, bronchitis can be felt to be a lot more hot and have a lot more mortality. But in laying hens, it's a little bit less and usually more as a result of complicated secondary infections. But you can have an increased mortality for sure. Egg production, again, it's that variation. It depends on which kind is going to come in. Um, and affect these birds. So you could have up to 70% production losses. We saw in that challenge study, they lost 90% of their production, um, but hopefully they will recover somewhat. Shell quality, again, loss of shell strength, wrinkled eggshells, that watery albumin. There is a vaccination available for it. We're gonna talk about those. <laughs> and treatment, no. Um, always good to remember that for viral diseases, there's no specific treatment like antibiotics. It's all things to support the health of the bird. Antigenic shift potential, that means how likely is this virus to change and to become different and to be something we need to protect against a new type of? And the answer is very, very high. Again, coronaviruses like to switch out uh, that spike protein in avian species. And so we're going to have a lot of different strains that come up that unfortunately are not cross-protective with each other. And then lastly, again, this is our gamma coronavirus, so it has no human health potential at all. As far as we know, it really doesn't even affect um, many species outside of poultry species, just other birds and even them, very, very few. So now that we've talked about the disease a little bit, what it is and what it looks like, let's talk about control strategies. Those control strategies are going to be, unfortunately, just vaccination and biosecurity, which is complicated and difficult to do, especially on large-scale production farms. So vaccination planning. Strain selection is key. So let's talk just a little bit about that. So strain selection is key. What do I mean by that? Well, we've all heard uh, that there are tons of different kinds of bronchitis and I've mentioned a few of them just in this talk. I've said things like the Massachusetts strain. I've said QX strain. There are other common ones like Connecticut and Arkansas, uh, 793B. There's a lot of different names out there based on the nomenclature of different countries that now is becoming more standardized. But what that should tell you is that there are tons and tons and tons of different kinds of these viruses. And the biggest downfall for us as poultry producers or people trying to protect the production of our farms and our birds is that they don't cross protect with each other. So most of the time, or all the time really, if I give you a vaccination for the Massachusetts strain of infectious bronchitis virus, but then your farm sees a, a challenge, a wild type challenge with a QX like strain, your birds are not protected at all. It will be as if you had never vaccinated them. And it's the same if you gave a QX type vaccine and then had a Massachusetts type challenge. So that's true of all these different serotypes, which makes life very complicated. It's really tough in India because I believe most of your commercially licensed products are just Massachusetts, which means you don't have the availability of other strains to get yourself some more cross protection. So there are some things that go on um, that people do vaccinate. Uh, I think there's some question as to how legal that is, <laughs> but you will see other types of vaccines floating around out there. But I believe for India specifically, only Massachusetts types are legally commercially available. So the next important point is you need effective coverage early, right? We talked about previous to three weeks, those birds have got to have some sort of vaccine on board in order to fight off early challenge, or you're going to end up with these problems 20 weeks later as a possibility that could really be a disaster to your production. You need to boost those and you need to boost them early and often. And I'll show you on the next slide what we're talking about there. And then you need to have both a live and killed program. Uh, something that's very, very common that I see as an issue in places like in Indonesia and in discussion with um, Bangladesh is that 
you will have a lot of killed vaccine because they want to boost titers and get high titer control and they will forego actually doing live vaccination. And that's a huge problem, especially with things like bronchitis virus and Newcastle disease. Because if we remember from the beginning, this virus is coming in through the nose, through the eyes, through the face. And when that happens, you want good local immunity. And that local immunity is the mucosa or the skin-like tissue on the inside of the mouth, on the, around the eyes, and on the inside of the nose. You can have nice local immunity there by giving a live vaccine at that site. And that's why live vaccines and strong mucosal immunity are so essential. We need killed vaccine to continue to help to raise and boost our titer. It's a very important part of the process. Um, but we also need to have that live vaccine available as well to stimulate strong mucosal immunity and protect them at the entry site. So what is our early vaccination strategy? How are we trying to control this false layer syndrome and this renal damage syndrome with bronchitis virus? Again, early vaccination is critical. They need to be vaccinated at day of age, either at the hatchery or at the farm. So you can do a spray vaccination. You know, a lot of people use spray cabinets, but this is how you would do it and older birds in the barn. And eye drop is another very effective strategy. You wanna repeat this at least twice by the time they're 28 days of age. This is really, really important. You need to show them bronchitis again in these high challenge areas at least two times by the time they're four weeks old. That's typically done at 10 days of age and 28 days of age. The critical point there is the second vaccination needs to happen before 14 days. So at minimum, when we're talking about dealing with bronchitis, we need a day of age vaccination at the hatcher at the farm, and we need to see our second vaccination before two weeks of age. We need to see our third vaccination before 28 days of age. So what sorts of strains are circulating in India? Uh, this is a paper by Mark Jackwood out of 2012. So it's a little bit older now, um, and some of this has changed some, but it gives you a good idea of what you're looking at for your region specifically. And the good news is that Massachusetts is one of the prevalent strains that's going on, and you do have a commercially available vaccine for that. Um, so this tells me MASH should probably be included in our protection programs in India. You also have a 793 B type strain. Then you have a couple actually that are um, untyped out. We're not sure exactly what they relate most closely to. I suspect some of these in here are more similar to a QX, um, but again, it's unpublished data, so we're not positive. I do know that you do have QX strain that runs around as well as a few others. So stepping away from vaccination for a minute, we'll kind of finish up here with biosecurity. So biosecurity, as Dr. John Glisson says, is inconvenient. And I think that's probably one of the best definitions I've ever heard of biosecurity, because it is. Biosecurity is about all the steps we need to take in order to prevent risk or slow risk of a disease coming in. So I think, again, the situation that we're in right now with COVID-19 and, and this coronavirus that it's affecting people is how inconvenient it is for everyone, right? I'm sure you've seen the news and the issues going on in, in America and Indonesia and other countries where people wanna go out or need to work and they don't want to because they need to stay home to stop the spread of the disease, which makes it inconvenient. So what are the inconvenient things that we need to focus on on our poultry farms? Well, these are the primary areas of biosecurity and there's a lot of them and it can be very, very intimidating to think about especially when we start talking about open-sided houses with outdoor access and limited control. You know, it's, it's easy to point a finger at somebody having a closed house that's tunnel ventilated and everything is under really strict regimen. Um, but then when you have an open house, how do we handle the same things with wild birds flying in and out with rodents and things? So we wanna focus on poultry and other animals, keeping them off the farm and away from our birds. Feed and water is a site, if I like to think of these as things, what, what is my bird gonna touch every single day? And feed and water are there. So you wanna make sure your feed is as clean as it can be, that your troughs are as clean as they can be. And with water, you can easily disinfect the water line. People and movement of people are critical. Um, I really wanna focus on this one for a second because this is your primary issue when we're talking about birds getting infected when they're younger. And what happens is a lot of us have multi-age farms, right? We bring in our uh, baby birds on the same farm and raise our pullets as we'd have laying hands on. And when that occurs, 
if you have the same people, the same equipment and things that are going back and forth, so vehicles and equipment, vaccines and equipment and people, and they're going from your older birds into your younger birds, especially up to three weeks of age, they are gonna carry virus at the most susceptible time point to those younger birds, making it a really high risk to have false layer syndrome and renal damage later on. So especially those first three weeks that your chicks arrive, do the best you can to have a dedicated employee or dedicated equipment and minimize that contact between older birds and younger birds. It's always a good idea simply because older birds are always going to bring in issues on your younger birds. Um, but certainly when we talk about bronchitis virus, this is really critical in the first couple of weeks. So with that, I will end my presentation just a couple minutes early here and see um, if there's anything else we need to go back over or pass it on over to Doug. Thank you, Dr. Sashi, for the insightful presentation. Uh, Doug, over to you. Okay, I think, I think we're ready to go. Um, thank you very much, uh, Sasha. That was a very excellent uh, presentation on on infectious bronchitis. Uh, I'd like to follow up on, on this talk by discussing uh, another disease which uh, is quite important in actually um, combining with bronchitis and other respiratory pathogens to, to create uh, uh, clinical problems in the field. So, Doug, yes, Doug, it is in view mode, put it in full screen. Right. Can you see it now? No, no, still seeing it. Uh -huh. Sorry. How are we now, Shresh? Can you see my full screen? I'm using two screens, Doug. No, Doug. Oh. You need to turn off a presenter view. Yeah. How are we now? Yeah, yeah, it's good. Okay, so look, sorry for the delay. Uh, the the first uh, point I'd like to bring up is that we we have some technical resources, some uh, uh, technical bulletins that have been written on uh, mycoplasma, both mycoplasma galliseptacum and and mycoplasma synovii. Um, Please uh, look for these. They're on the Highline uh, website, or you can contact uh, Srinivasa's technical team, and they will be happy to uh, get those materials to you. So the basics of both MG and MS are, uh, are contained there, and so I won't go into a, a lot of small details about, about it. You can look for that yourself. So principally, we're, we're concerned about two mycoplasmas in commercial layers. Uh, they're MG, which is mycoplasma galliseptacum, and MS, mycoplasma synovii. Mycoplasmas in general is a very old 
primitive type bacteria that lacks a cell wall. And that has some practical significance in that because it has no cell wall, it's actually quite susceptible to most of the disinfectants that we, we use on our poultry farms. So cleaning up mycoplasma in the environment, uh, in theory, should not be difficult. The problem occurs on multiple age farms where the mycoplasma is continually continuing to cycle from older infected birds to young susceptible birds coming, coming onto the farm. And that's further aggravated if our growing, our rearing and our laying operation is in the same location, uh, which is a common uh, setup in, in India. So what we find is on these multiple age layer farms that uh, mycoplasma becomes uh, a persistent infection uh, and difficult to eliminate because we're never in a situation where the farm is completely emptied of birds and we could, we could clean it up and break the cycle. Wild birds are uh, a factor in the spread of mycoplasma. I believe uh, most cases though, we're actually dealing with uh, a transmission chicken to chicken or, or uh, contaminated material from infected chickens to other chickens. But wild birds do uh, serve a role in the spread of mycoplasma. Mycoplasma is a vertically transmitted disease. So the breeders can pass that uh, uh, organism on to other, uh, other um, commercial birds. And that is uh, uh, the reason why in breeding stock, we, we take great care to monitor uh, on a continual basis where we're intermittently collecting samples, testing for mycoplasma to ensure that the breeders from the GP to the parent stock uh, to the commercial chick is, is being controlled. Srinivasa does a very excellent job. Uh, Highline and Srinivasa work very closely together uh, on these programs. So let's start with Mycoplasma galliseptacum. I'll just call it MG from now on. And the principal way it's transmitted is through aerosol, through close contact uh, with, with the virus on droplets, on dust, and uh, the, the bacteria is inspired into the uh, respiratory tract. So it sets up initially in an infection in the head, the sinuses, the conjunctiva around the eyes, uh, and the trachea. That infection then uh, moves on to the, tr uh, to the lungs, to the air sacs, and then eventually uh, reaches the oviduct. The uh, pathogenicity of uh, MG is very variable. We have strains that are highly pathogenic, and then we have milder strains. And some of those milder strains have actually been uh, utilized as uh, vaccine candidates. When MG uh, uh, is pathogenic, it tends to cause a very uh, severe uh, respiratory disease, very profound drops in egg production. And this is particularly true when the uh, MG is combined with other respiratory pathogens or opportunistic bacteria like E. coli. Comparing MG to MS, uh, MG tends to be more pathogenic than MS strains. It also, in the US, uh, 30 to 40% of the commercial lane flocks are positive for, for uh, MG, uh, but vaccination is also very widespread. In the case of uh, MS or mycoplasma synovii, the same sequence of events occurs during the uh, transmission and infection. It begins as a upper respiratory infection that spreads 
through the trachea to the air sacs and lungs onto the oviduct, but with an additional issue in that it could spread systemically to the joints and cause uh, uh, lameness in birds. In fact, that's why MS is called Mycoplasma synovii, is uh, recognizing these joint infections. It's not a common occurrence to see that. Uh, personally, I've only seen it twice uh, in my career where we you've had a significant uh, joint issue from uh, Mycoplasma syn synovii. But both of, both of those occurrences uh, have been in Asia. Uh, China has recently had a very serious problem with uh, MS in uh, breeders and, and commercial birds. <clears throat> Comparing MS to MG, uh, MS is, uh, has also a lot of variability in its uh, pathogenicity, and there are very many strains of MS that cause no clinical disease whatsoever. In fact, they go largely unrecognized by the commercial producer. In the US, uh, MS is very widely distributed in the commercial uh, layer farms and 80 to 90 percent of the multiple age layer farms are uh, MS uh, positive. A little bit about the disease. Of course, we all show uh, the best disease pictures we can find. And here's a, a bird with a very severe uh, sinusitis of the infraorbital uh, sinus. Uh, in most cases, we won't see such a obvious uh, swelling. The swelling may be more general head swelling and, and to a lesser extent. Um, similar to the pictures that Seisha showed with uh, infectious bronchitis, we can get the the bird on the left looks almost identical to one of the pictures she showed. And, and there's a good reason for that, is that there are many respiratory pathogens that give very similar clinical signs. And just by looking at them, just by doing necropsies, uh, is usually not going to be sufficient way of uh, differentially diagnosing uh, many of these problems. The picture on the right shows an air sac that is uh, severely infected. You can see the caseus exudate sitting inside uh, the thoracic air sac. And uh, we can also see that these air sacs uh, can appear bubbly uh, initially, and then later in the disease process become more cloudy, more thickened, and with a uh, caseous exudate. Here we see an acutely affected uh, air sac. This is, becomes more um, obvious when uh, secondary bacteria um, also make a mixed infection. As I mentioned before, with uh, Mycoplasma synovii, MS, uh, joint infections uh, occur. Uh, these joint infections are not uh, really uh, distinguishable between other reasons for joint swelling. Uh, Staphylococcus, another bacteria, is a very common uh, joint infection and the appearance is, is very, very similar to that. So uh, keep it in mind that mycoplasma MS can, could be involved. The, the money here to the commercial egg uh, producer is the loss of egg production that occurs uh, from these infections. And so we'll typically see that uh, birds sometime during the peaking period will experience a egg drop. That egg drop may be uh, not so much, 10% or less, or it could be quite profound. What typically occurs in, in, in my experience is we get more of a, a roller coaster type of uh, egg production where egg production drops, the farmer implements uh, a, a 
an antibiotic treatment in the feed. Things improve for a short period of time, but the effect of that seems to be uh, short-lived and we see egg production drops again. Again, repeating antibiotic treatment, maybe some improvement. Each time that's done, there, there seems to be less and less uh, improvement in the egg production. So this roller coaster type of uh, egg curve is, is common. When it comes to the vaccination, we, we do have some uh, uh, options here, and this would be my preference for controlling mycoplasma is through vaccinations. There's, for MG, there's uh, live and inactivated vaccines available. For MS, there is a, a live vaccine. Uh, these vaccines are not uh, all available in India. In fact, I, I'm not sure if any of them are. Uh, perhaps someone else could comment on that. But comparing the live MG vaccines, the original vaccine was F strain. F strain is a mild, but not so mild uh, vaccine strain. It has some uh, pathogenic character to it that uh, if we take F strain and vaccinate a MG negative bird, it will reduce its egg production to some extent. But in flocks that are MG infected, F strain does provide uh, uh, a reduction of clinical signs. It makes the transmission of MG bird to bird uh, uh, less, and it uh, keeps the egg production losses uh, to a minimum. Later on, other live MG vaccines were developed made of milder strains, 685 and TS11 are, are two examples uh, of those. These vaccines also can reduce clinical signs, uh, make it more difficult for MG to move bird to bird and prevent economic loss from uh, mortality and, and, and egg production. Because these vaccines are mild, uh, some of them have been uh, manipulated in the laboratory. They don't uh, persist well outside uh, of the bird in the environment. And so it makes them uh, a bit safer. F-strain is a vaccine that can spread bird to bird very well. And in fact, sometimes that spread is problematic if they're in areas where you have unvaccinated uh, susceptible birds. So ideally, we want to use these milder strain vaccines, 685 or TS11. Uh, but if we see a poor response, sometimes F strain can be used for one or two cycles on a multiple age farm. Uh, it tends to displace the field bacteria uh, and uh, makes it uh, then possible to use the milder vaccines, the safer vaccines uh, on these farms. The killed MG vac vaccination is, is the original MG vaccine. Uh, it, it, it works well, uh, but I think uh, it's, it's probably not as effective as, as the live vaccines. There is a live MS vaccine called MSH, um, and uh, that is available in some countries, not, not all. And uh, it's also a mild strain. It's uh, basically the uh, equivalent of TS11 for, for MS. TS11 and MSH are vaccines that are frozen. So there's some issues with the uh, storage in maintaining the cold chain with, with those vaccines. Um, 685 usually requires a fine spray application um, or uh, intranasal has, has been done in, in some locations. Now the other, the other broad option for control of mycoplasma is, is medication. Uh, it is a bacteria, so there is the option of, of treatment here. Uh, a number of uh, 
antibiotics have been used. Oxytetracycline, chlorotetracycline are, are two common ones, as are Tylosin and Timulin. Uh, these are widely used vaccines, and they do have uh, efficacy. They, they show in treated birds that clinical, clinical signs are reduced, the transmission of the um, MG bird to bird is reduced, and the loss in egg production is also uh, reduced with antibiotic treatment. But uh, antibiotic treatment will not prevent infection and it will not prevent the shedding of bacteria, nor will vaccination. So there's many programs that are out there which uh, use intermittent uh, feed medication using these antibiotics. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the details of, of those programs. I'll let the uh, local experts uh, address that and, and discuss which ones they think are, are best. The problem with antibiotics is that there is a lot of resistance to these antibiotics. These are old antibiotics. They've been used for a long time. In India, uh, it's, it's a sad reality that antibiotics are quite widely used and abused uh, in commercial layers. And uh, I believe resistant strains are probably quite common there. Of course, if there's a resistant strain, the antibiotic has no beneficial effect at all. And I think that's why we're seeing such variable results from these uh, feed medication programs. The, the important thing that I'd like to discuss about mycoplasma is its interaction with other pathogens, respiratory pathogens. And I mentioned E. coli. It's very common that Mg plus E. coli makes a uh, uh, CRD, uh, it makes a egg uh, yolk peritonitis problems uh, very common. There's also interactions with uh, infectious bronchitis, low path influenza, uh, Newcastle, and uh, infectious laryngeal tracheitis. So if we're experiencing these problems on our commercial farms, we should uh, keep in mind that Mycoplasma may be the potentiator of, of those problems. And sometimes it's the case that we have to deal with mycoplasma first before we really see uh, any benefit to our preventative programs for infectious bronchitis, Newcastle, influenza, so on. So the, the message here, mycoplasma will make other respiratory pathogens more dangerous. So here's just a picture showing the same thing. Here we have a lot of the conditions, the diseases that we commonly see on an Indian layer farm. And they, they can also come as mixed infections. In fact, I think in most cases, these chronic respiratory disease conditions are mixed infections. As I mentioned before, the combination of uh, mycoplasma, even a mild uh, MS strain that by itself would cause no clinical disease in the flock when combined with E. coli, now we see increased mortality from uh, peritonitis. And peritonitis is a very common uh, cause of mortality on commercial air farms. So my kind of take home message for you uh, with mycoplasma is keep in mind that uh, it's difficult to diagnose mycoplasma. It's uh, sometimes occurring in, in flocks, uh, but not uh, causing any clinical signs. But when we combine them with these other pathogens, for example, infectious bronchitis, now we're reaching the threshold where we are going to see uh, significant egg drops, significant loss of uh, money uh, due, due to that. This can go further if we combine 
it with environmental stresses. The hot season, which is currently underway in India, is probably the, the hot, the environmental stress we, we all know about. Uh, it occurs every year in India, and it's probably the most severe of, of any place I, I visit in the world. So we put heat stress on top of this. Now we start seeing more mortality. We start to see even, even more uh, egg production loss. Then the killer is you add E. coli on top of that and you've got a pile of uh, dead chickens. Just ask, ask Dr. Prasad. He's seen many of these piles in his career and uh, it's, it's a common problem. So, as we work through these issues, we need to sort of sort out, tease out all the factors that may be involved in, and to the best of our ability to deal with them. So our goal with uh, vaccination of any type is that we wanna create this flock immunity. We, we hear, hear about herd immunity a lot now with the, the human, uh, coronavirus problems, and it's true. Uh, what we need to do through our vaccination, through our biosecurity, is to prevent uh, too many birds from being infected. We need to have enough immune individuals in the flock that it's difficult now for a pathogen to enter into that flock and spread around and, and create a disease problem. So when we have faults in biosecurity, faults in our environment from too much heat stress, we addressed heat stress in our last uh, webinar. Um, when these things come together, now we see that our, our flock immunity is, is really breaking down and this is when we see our, our biggest problems. So I like Seisha, uh, I'm very much uh, a, uh, proponent of biosecurity. Biosecurity is the one way that we can try to make our farm cleaner than the next guy's farm by having a, an effective biosecurity program. But it's not easy to do. We have to identify where the weak points are on our farm. Every farm is different. And then after identifying the, the pathways that a pathogen could enter into our farm, we need to then develop uh, biosecurity programs that will tend to mitigate those risks. The big ones uh, I, I see in India that, uh, and, and I'm sure you've all seen it too, wild birds. Uh, wild birds are present on nearly every Indian commercial layer farm, and sometimes in great quantities. If there's no fence around the uh, manure pit, these birds will all come in flocks to eat the, the feed in the manure, to eat the bugs that are growing in the manure. And so we may see many commercial farms where there is just as many wild birds underneath the house eating residual feed as there are chickens above laying eggs. And I think this is so common in, in India that many producers forget to see that. They, they don't realize the threat that this poses in terms of disease. Today our topic's disease, so I, I push this point very, very hard. So we need to have uh, fencing, bird-proof fencing, uh, not only for the birds above, but the manure pit uh, below. This is a minimum requirement to have any type of uh, uh, biosecurity on, on the farm. The other uh, uh, animal, wild animal, that uh, is very common to find on farms are, are rodents. Uh, in India, you have a warm climate, so these rodents can actually uh, harbor outside of the house in the surrounding area, 
and then at night they they come in so the control of rodents is is very very problematic because uh most of the commercial layer farms are open houses uh it's very hard to keep keep rodents out but that doesn't mean we shouldn't continue to try with uh, baiting with trying to uh, uh, close the openings for, for rodents to enter into the house. The other one is dead bird disposal. Um, uh, this is quite variable also in India. You see some farmers doing a, a good job like, like shown here where they have a uh, proper incinerator. That incinerator is uh, closed off you know the the dogs, the other other birds uh, uh, don't get in there, um, and then you see other farms where it's not not done well at all. They're, the dead birds are just being taken out uh, away from the house and uh, and and buried. Sometimes they only buried every every few days. So we should do as best we can in terms of. Uh, People, uh, Sasha mentioned it, and she's she's so right about this. Is that people coming on and off the farm is a very excellent source of bringing in pathogens. The people coming on the farms may have been poultry uh, workers. They may be exposed to village chickens. Uh, they may be vendors in the poultry industry, and they spend their day going farm to farm, visiting the farms. And so these visitors and workers are very potential threats to our farm. We should have some effort to um, change the footwear uh, and give some type of a, a, a disinfectant uh, cleaning, uh, foot baths, and then uh, sprayers like this are, are all helpful. The hair of a human is a very uh, important fomite for the spread of, of pathogens, and so we, we need to consider that. Uh, either spraying it as shown here, or even better would be uh, hair nets. Here you can see uh, another one, a nice foot bath. There's no uh, option for uh, not going through. Uh, uh, this facility, you go through, your feet are immersed in disinfectant and, and you're being sprayed. These aren't 100%, but they are certainly uh, a big improvement. On India, it's very common that our eggs are being sold to traders. These traders may be coming to the farm and picking up eggs. Perhaps the producer is delivering his eggs uh, to another site to, to uh, sell, sell his eggs, but we need to be very cognizant of the fact that these plastic egg flats, the vehicles going back and forth are very big sources of uh, poultry diseases because they're going to an area where the product of many farms are being collected. Sometimes the egg flats are not going back to the original farm. They're going back to uh, other farms. So there has to be a program for cleaning and disinfecting uh, these, these uh, egg flats. Preferably, there would be uh, um, paper egg flats and it would be a one-way trip where nothing comes back to, to the farm. So in general, biosecurity, a lot, of, a lot of artwork on my slides here. Um, we've, uh, we've put together a poster, uh, Srinivasa and Highline, to uh, look at some of the uh, key points we think are involved in uh, biosecurity on the Indian layer farm. Uh, again, you can uh, have access to this. Uh, have a copy of this. Our, our technical team would be happy to uh, follow up with you. But uh, I think this would be an excellent thing to put on the wall in the office, encourage the 
workers to understand these threats, to sit down with your workers and provide some education to them uh, so that they understand why these things are important. So with that, uh, that concludes my uh, presentation. Back, back to Rakesh. Thank you, Doug, for the interactive session. So we'll go for Q&A now. Yeah. 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 So Doug, uh, is it visible? Sorry? The uh, questions I have just put on the screen. Yeah, I see them. You can address one by one. OK. Um, yeah, and uh, I, I invite uh, not only Sasha to join in on these answers, but uh, uh, Dr. Prasad and, and, and the other members of Srinivas's technical team um, to do so. Yeah. So uh, yeah. I'll, I'll just read, read the question. Can we go for vaccination of live vaccines like 495 or D780 uh, during the laying period? Uh, Sasha, I'll let you do the bronchitis. Muted. You might have to unmute her, Rakesh. There we go. Thank you. Um, so yeah, it's quite common to still use a live vaccine um, during egg production. Uh, in my experience, it has been not too much of an issue, usually given that there's so much challenge, it's better the small hit you might take from vaccination. Um, the more important thing to me is making sure you vaccinate everybody at the same time, if possible. So especially on older lay farms, where I see people get into trouble, is when we use live vaccines, especially hotter live vaccines, is they have a very ineffective vaccination process, which causes a lot of passage from bird to bird, and you can actually have a ramping up of the infection and then give the birds a full-blown bronchitis issue. Uh, Doug, in your experience, do you use different strains or lower, I guess, pathogenicity strains when you vaccinate in lay? Um, yeah, and, uh, in, in India, it's, it's, it's basically, uh... I think 491 and, and uh, Massachusetts available to to use. And during the lane period, I I, I agree with Sasha's comments, and I would like to add that uh, in addition to making sure all the the birds are exposed to these vaccines at the same time, uh, ideally, if we have a live boosting program during the lane period, we're also vaccinating all the flocks within a pretty tight window so that uh, we're not creating any situation where that bronchitis could move around the farm and potentially become uh, more pathogenic. The, the other thing is the gap between uh, live vaccinations. Um, it usually ranges between six and 10 weeks. Um, we don't want to vaccinate more than we have to but we also don't want to let the gap be too wide uh, because if immunity drops in the flock, sometimes when we revaccinate with a booster, uh, we can get some, some reaction to that. And that usually will show up in, in terms of uh, uh, egg shell quality. Um, So I would say, just to summarize, that during the lane period, a boosting program is an option, and uh, I would uh, reserve that for farms, particularly that are having some problem they feel to be due to bronchitis. And then the other, just step up on that too, is um, especially given the discussions you know, we just had from Dr. Grieve on his lecture on mycoplasmas, if you think there's an ongoing mycoplasma outbreak currently in your birds and you come in with a live bronchitis vaccination, you can also certainly have some problems associated with that. So we don't wanna vaccinate with these live respiratory vaccines when we have a concurrent issue. So the, the second question is, can IB live vaccine for 
commercial broiler control. Can I be there? I what? think it's a broiler question, perhaps, and uh, I, I, I don't know anything about broilers, so uh, I'm sure. So the answer, the answer for that one is yes. Um, you, you, there are programs, obviously, for, for broilers, and if you contact um, whoever you're working with, whether that be an aviagen group or otherwise, um, they can give you some really nice control strategies for that. But they're the same types of vaccines. It's the same strain that affect laying hens. So you do need to have a nice control program in place for broilers with bronchitis. Um, the third question is, uh, India is endemic for QX? Not a question, or... it's uh, information. Uh, yeah. Sorry? Third is not a question, it's an information. Somebody shared, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, and, uh, I, I agree. I, I think I've seen uh, an instance of uh, QX in, in India. And there's no reason why it would, wouldn't be in India, in India. Things in China tend to make its way India way uh, because of its proximity, because of uh, overlap in uh, migratory routes of uh, wild birds. So uh, I'm sure I'm sure it's present. The uh, Fourth one is: Is it advisable to do IB, IBD live vaccination in the in the same day? And I, my experience in commercial land farms, that's not a problem. Uh, uh, we see sometimes uh, mass application techniques, water, uh, particularly where the two are two are combined uh, for convenience sake. They're, there's no interference that uh, I'm aware of, and and that practice is actually quite widely done in in the field. Stacia, any yep. further? I, I agree completely. That's the same. Um, next one: Can we vaccinate with H uh, one twenty in a case of a IB outbreak? Um, I. Vaccinating after an outbreak is uh, not going to be the most rewarding experience uh, in the world. Uh, vaccines are a prevention. They are to designed to create immunity prior to exposure. And so I would think uh, there would be very little benefit to, to giving uh, IV vaccination after clinical signs uh, have, have developed. Good. Um, is it advisable using IBMA5 vaccine at one day of age uh, or at the hatchery or at the farm level over uh, H120? Um, yeah, Seisha, go ahead. Go ahead. I think. Yeah. So the um... MA5 vaccine is a little bit hotter or stronger than the H120 vaccine. It's a great vaccine to go ahead and use at the hatchery or at the farm. That's fine. You can use both to potentially even increase your protection a little bit. That would be okay too. So I have no problems using the MA5, especially given the challenge level that you guys are going to face in India. I tend to go for the hotter, more endogenic vaccines. Yeah, uh, agreed. And, and even though MA5 and H120 are basically Massachusetts type viruses, they do provide some different uh, cross protective properties. So, uh, you know, to use the two together in a program um, would broaden the cross protection. Not a lot, not, not like if we were using a different uh, sero, serotype vaccine, but uh, I think any opportunity for us to include uh, whatever strains uh, are available to us in India uh, makes a, a more cross-protective uh, immunity in the end. Okay, uh, probability of success of MG live vaccine in multiple age groups. Um, I think it's, it, it is uh, a reasonably good probability that you will have uh, success there. 
in fact, it's, it's probably uh, much better than the killed vaccine. The live vaccines, um, particularly F strain, uh, and a little bit with 685, they have the ability to, uh, to move, to cross protect other birds. And so on a multiple age farm, the, the way MG vaccines often work, particularly with F strain, is it's displacing the field virus. You're, you're flooding the flock with uh, vaccine with the hope that we're, you're going to occupy all the receptor sites uh, available in the birds in the flock and exclude this more pathogenic field strain. And so that usually requires using these live vaccines over a couple of cycles. It doesn't happen immediately, but there is some hope that uh, eventually you've replaced the pathogenic field virus for a less pathogenic, uh, or I keep saying virus, the field back for a less pathogenic uh, vaccine bacteria. So long answer to a, a short question, but yes, I think, I think that is a, uh, a good approach toward controlling MG on a multiple age uh, farm. I just wanna back you up on that. Doug, I mean, I think that the, the biggest critical point that I have when I try to do this vaccination in multi-age laying farms is people think it's going to work the first time around. And we need several flocks of this process to get a good protection going on. I think that's really critical to remember that this takes time. Yes. Okay. Um, next question is, um, please suggest preventative vaccination schedule for farms which are having uh, infectious gout problems. And uh, I'll, I'll turn this over to Seisha because I think she addressed this in her, her presentation. Yep, sure. So um, remembering the presentation, we discussed how what we believe is happening is an infection with some sort of variant strain of bronchitis virus within the first three weeks of age. And the schedule that we really want to impress or work on to prevent that early renal damage is having a vaccination with bronchitis virus at day of age, so either at the hatchery or when they arrive to your farm. You need to have a second vaccination before 14 days of age. A lot of people typically go at 10 days. And then you need to have a third vaccination before 28 days of age or at 28 days of age. So you want three vaccination processes before 28 days, First one is the day that they're born, the day that they hatch. The second one is going to be 14 days or less, and the third one is 28 days or less. Yes, I, I, I agree with all that. You got, you got to get that early vaccination in and then uh, reinforce that with a booster in, in a short period of time. So the next uh, question is, um, among different MG vaccine strains, F strain 685, TS11, which one is more vertically transmitted um, so that it can protect the progeny in the field? That, the premise of that question, I, I don't agree with. I don't think we want to use these vaccines uh, in breeders to generate maternal antibodies. That's not really uh, uh, so much the, the approach that we, we'd like to take. In, in breeders, uh, we, we would preferably not use these live MG vaccines. If, if we needed to provide some protection to the breeder, uh, I would prefer an inactivated uh, vaccination or a combination of early antibiotic treatments and then uh, early vaccination with a with an inactivated uh, product. Maternal antibodies for MG, I, I don't I don't know if they're so protective in progeny uh, anyway, maybe maybe Seisha has some information there. You know, I haven't had much success trying to protect progeny by using parent stock vaccination. 
Um, so even in, in other poultry species that I've worked with, typically we use the vaccination process just to protect the birds. Um, and the biggest reason for that, I think, is exactly what you said in your PowerPoint, Doug, which is that uh, we're not really protecting against infection or shedding. We're just decreasing the clinical signs and the issues we see from a production level. And so those parent stock progeny are still going to most likely encounter mycoplasmas in the environment that the birds are in, and they're still going to pass those. So on some level, we're just trying to mitigate that as much as possible. So the focus should be on each individual flock, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that, that's how I see it too. Uh, in, in parent stock, we, we want to keep, the, keep those birds mycoplasma free. We want the commercial chick to come to your farm uh, free of mycoplasma, knowing that exposure, exposure is probably going to occur uh, on the commercial farm. But uh, uh, by, by doing that, by reducing or eliminating the vertical transmission, we give the flock a much, much better chance of, uh, of uh, success commercially, uh, economically. So the next question, the difference in clinical symptoms and, and post-mortem lesions in QX bronchitis and IB-491 strain, which is the best combination to control mycoplasma? Uh, one live, one killed, uh, one live or two killed. I'll, I'll answer the mycoplasma side. Uh, typically, the live vaccines, which is what, what uh, I prefer, um, would be uh, one, one vaccination sometimes two, uh, the live uh, vaccination followed by a point of lay killed vaccine is, is uh, another option to use for vaccine. Uh, one live and two killed, that would be uh, getting into a pretty expensive program. Uh, these bacterins for mycoplasma are, are a bit reactive. We, we really wouldn't want to uh, uh, subject the bird to having to react to two oil vaccines like that from, from mycoplasma. So I guess for me, it would either be a one live vaccination or a one live plus a, a killed, killed uh, MG factor. Uh, I'll take the, uh, the, the quick question on um, QX versus 491 strain. So I'm going to give you all a classic VTOR response here, which is it depends um, because there are several different possibilities for this clinical syndrome to arrive. So at the end of the day, both QX and 491 can be nephrogenic. So you might see um, strains that have kidney issues and gout. You might see false layer syndrome. You might see those upper respiratory syndromes. You might just see mortality. It's very nebulous, so meaning very difficult to grasp, right, sometimes. And so you're not going to have something in the field, like there's never been a time for me where I can walk into the field and say, this is 491 or this is QX. I would need some laboratory diagnostics to be absolutely positive. I can feel fairly confident this is bronchitis and we need to find out where we're having a problem. And that's how I would approach that situation. Okay, next question. Could you please explain more on thymulin plus selenomycin dose, how much time, how many days? Uh, uh, I, I'm not gonna go into programs. I'll let the uh, producers of these antibiotics uh, promote their programs. There's a wide variety of them out there. Uh, typically, it could be one, one week on medication per month, uh, repeated for the life of the of the flock, but there's also many other other variations on on that theme. So uh, the dose, the time, and how many days uh, I will defer that to uh, to uh, the uh, Srinivasa technical team and, and and the local experts. Uh, next question: Is it advisable to vaccinate commercial layers against mycoplasma? 
Uh, yeah, in my opinion, uh, it, it is. I think commercial lane flocks, the uh, risk of exposure is high. Uh, all commercial lane flocks in India that I visited are multiple age, sometimes with the rearing and the lane houses all together on the same house. Uh, biosecurity is marginal on many of these farms. Uh, so yes, I think that it's to our benefit to vaccinate the commercial layers for, for mycoplasma, uh, to set up some immunity and then let that help us control some of the other uh, respiratory uh, diseases that, that are likely to, to occur there as well. I think the one thing we haven't talked a lot about, and it's probably the more significant disease is uh, low path uh, avian influenza. And I think to put our best foot forward on preventing economic losses from that disease, it is uh, a good idea for us to also have a, a mycoplasma vaccination program. These live vaccines are, are not cheap. Uh, they're costly, and, uh, and I think that's the reason why uh, medicated feed programs uh, continue to be used a lot, even though resistance may be a program, a problem, uh, because of cost. But I think in the end, vaccination is, is a cost-effective uh, approach. Um, next question. In India, increased prevalence of MS is being detected than MG. And, uh, so more MS than MG and associated with eggshell defects. Um, when we administer antimycoplasmal drugs, we get a transient response. How do we address this permanently? Yeah, great question. I, I would break that down into that uh, yes, MS is much more common to see than MG. If you're uh, monitoring the flocks serologically, uh, flocks almost invariably go MS positive, MG, maybe yes, maybe no. The association with eggshell defects, um, I, would, I would figure that's probably an interaction with bronchitis would be my opinion there. Uh, bronchitis, we all, we all know that it is uh, uh, well known for its ability to cause eggshell defects. And so then when they say we administer antimycoplasma antibiotics, we get a transient response. Yes, that's typically what we'll see is this roller coaster egg production, roller coaster egg shell quality uh, issue uh, with, with antibiotic treatments. So how do we address it permanent, permanently? One would be to establish immunity prior to exposure with uh, mycoplasma vaccines, and then coming through with, with a very sound bronchitis vaccination program, I think would give us our, our best chance to, to control that. Uh, next question is, uh, what's the interaction of MS with IB and MG? Um, I, I attempted to address that in my presentation. MS, why not always causing clinical disease uh, alone, is a potentiator for these other respiratory pathogens, and IB would be one of, one of the most important ones. MG could also work in that same way. So yes, they, they do interact. Um, next question, commercial layers. Uh, next, you wanna say something? No? Commercial layers vaccinated four times with a live and followed by one killed. IV vaccination was done. What uh, ELISA titer can be considered uh, to prevent egg drops. So, so the question is, we've got a flock that's been uh, multiple vaccinated with live as a, 
well as a killed vaccine, what would be the ELISA titer we would consider uh, protective that would prevent us from having egg drops? And that's, uh, that depends too. Uh, it's a uh, situation where the um, ELISA test is typically measuring Massachusetts antibodies. So to the extent that the vaccination program generated a Massachusetts type of antibody, it measures that best. And so in that case, if we see titers uh, up around the 10,000 level, that's, that's a pretty good response. And, and of course, the uniformity of those titers is just in, as important as the average. So we'd wanna have good uniformity uh, associated with that. But to use ELISA titers as a predictor of uh, protection is very, very shaky. Uh, I think if your challenge is uh, another strain that's not well me measured as well by the ELISA kit, then it's going to be very difficult to say which level of titer is, is going to be protective. Sasha, you want to? talk more? Sure. Um, no, I agree with you. I think in terms of that, I always am very, very careful to say that my titers are at an appropriate level for protection. We have generalized ones, but in the, the reality is even with things like low path um, avian influenza, uh, avian, low path avian influenza or Newcastle disease, you can have really high titers and still have breakthrough wild type strains. Um, so I agree completely there. And the only other thing I would say is if they're trying to ask the question as well um, of how can we tell the difference between a wild type challenge in our titer profile. Um, I have some information from a, an older presentation um, on bronchitis that says you're looking when it's a wild type strain or something that actually came in and broke through. You want to see around an 18 fold increase in your titer. Um, not so if it's 12 or less, it probably wasn't a full blown challenge. Um, an 18 fold increase in your titers is more indicative of a wild type infection. Again, I'm not sure how much I would rely on those numbers. Um, I think we need to take in, do we see respiratory signs? Do we see these other problems? And, and always, I agree with Doug completely that we would not count on our titer to guarantee us protection against anything. Yeah. Uh, the next, uh, actually, the next two questions are talking about uh, what's the effect of dosage of uh, antibiotics to use for mycoplasma, uh, ty tylosin, I think, and oxytetracycline. Um, again, I'll, I'll leave that for the uh, the vendors and the local experts to uh, to advise a program. So I'll skip ahead to the to the next one. Um, can we use live vaccine during viral outbreak? What type eggs are found during a virus disease and explain? Uh, yeah, it depends on which virus disease we're, we're talking about. Um, if, if it's uh, bronchitis, and, and I think, you know, with a commercial lane flock, that's always one of the most important ones we would deal with. Yes, we can use a, uh, no, this is just talking about using a live vaccine during an outbreak. I would say with bronchitis, probably very difficult to, to do that and see anything. With Newcastle, there's, there's reports in the field. You can uh, uh, use uh, vaccination during an outbreak and that will uh, uh, reduce the mortality. Uh, not eliminate it, but reduce the mortality. So it's a, a, a way of fighting fire with more fire. It's not the best way to, uh, to control diseases, but in, in the case of Newcastle, there, there may be some benefit for bronchitis. I, I would say no. no. I would agree completely. And a lot of it too has to do with how quickly the virus spreads. I mean, bronchitis is going to be through your whole flock, your whole farm really, really quickly. And so you don't really have time to beat the virus with a vaccination to some of the birds. I think that plays a key role. 
The only one off the top of my head that I say immediately go in and vaccinate for is actually pox. So if you have a problem with wet pox or you know even dry pox, although it usually isn't too much of an issue, you can go through and vaccinate the entire farm and stop that disease process in its tracks. So the only time I tend to really vaccinate um, where live virus during an outbreak is with pox. I think the other one, although I personally haven't had experience with it, is ILT. I think you can get in front of an ILT break. Um, but that's as far as I go. I try not to vaccinate birds with anything when they're already sick, though, in general. Yeah, that, that's two very good points Seisha bring, brings up. I, I agree with her comments there. So the next question is uh, whether it's advantageous to do beak dipping for IB at one day of age. Uh, yeah, it can be. Uh, beak dipping is a, a, a individual bird application, so that has uh, some benefit there. Um, and as Seisha mentioned in her vaccination programming comments, is that we need to have uh, early uh, vaccination uh, to get uh, some control on uh, on this false layer, uh, urolithiasis gout problems that can occur. So yes, beak, beak dipping at one day of age uh, is, is an option, as is eye dropping, uh, as is a coarse spray application. Um, next question, can force molting help in regaining the production curve in an IB infected flock? Um, yeah, that's, that's a great question. I, I think it can. Uh, the, what happens in force molting is that we're, we're making the oviduct completely regress back to an inactive state, rejuvenating uh, uh, some bacteria, uh, or rejuvenating the tissues, and then bringing that flock on for a, a second cycle. And in the second cycle, we'll typically see uh, uh, better egg production, better shell problems, and sometimes uh, these eggshell defects are, are also improved uh, with force molting. Uh, it's not a, it's not a uh, guaranteed result, but I think uh, give, taking the birds out of production, uh, making that oviduct not really a target of the pathogen uh, so much anymore could could have benefits for the production curve. Anything more? Anything you okay, want to add? Can I ask you a follow-up question to that, Doug? What age would be your break point for doing a forced molt or not doing a forced molt on a bronchitis flight? How would you choose when to to do that? Like if you had if you had bronchitis outbreak, for example, during peak, would you then force molt them? Or if you're at 70 weeks, would you just go ahead and say it's not worth force molting? Yeah, that, that's that's a great question, and it depends. Uh, it's kind of a one of these situations where if if the eggshell problem is so bad that the farmer is is losing a lot, the flock's no longer profitable, then they should consider that. But generally, force molting is not uh, commonly used as a as a management technique for for these these kind of problems. So. I guess only in very uh, dire situations, I, I would uh, even mention that to, to a producer. Great, thank you. Okay, moving on. Uh, three live IB vaccinations uh, in 28 days, which I think is within 28 days, is suggested uh, for only gout prone farms or as a common schedule. It is a common schedule because you never know when today is the day that your farm is going to become a gout prone farm <laughs> because we don't know what's circulating and what somebody else may have brought in. What may have never been a problem yesterday is now a problem you'll live with on your farm for the rest of your life. So these bronchitis vaccination schedules are about prevention and decreasing the risk that that's going to happen to you. So if you have a gout prone farm, you need to be doing this now. If you don't have a gout prone farm, you need to be doing this now to make sure you don't become a gout prone farm. 
Yeah, ag agreed. You know, the we need to give multiple live vaccines during the rearing period, ideally utilizing different serotypes of, of uh, vaccine so that we can safely build a cross protective immunity to because we don't usually know what what is the uh, uh, challenge strain. Uh, the laboratory work needed to to identify that is is not done uh, very often. So we're just covering the bases. And so multiple vaccination uh, early in the early part of the the rearing period is important. And then we boost that up at the point of lay with uh, either more live vaccination or, or a killed bronchitis vaccine. Uh, next one. Is it possible that high IB titer, you can, I think it was, what I was saying here is, is it possible we can have a high IB titer and still have the disease due to a lack of a live boosting during the laying period? So my answer here would be yes and no. <laughs> um, so it's possible to have a high IB titers and still get disease. I think you should just leave that as its own sentence. Because again, when we're testing, how are you testing for your titer, right? If it's an ELISA kit, we're testing for titers against typically, I think, Massachusetts. Um, there are some other kits out there. But that doesn't tell us if we have protection against the QAX strain or against 491 or whatever our birds may be encountering. It just says we have a, lie t a, lie, a large titer to this. Um, in terms of is it possible that I gave them Massachusetts strain, Massachusetts strain, Massachusetts strain, I have a really nice titer against Massachusetts strain, and then I got a live challenge with Massachusetts and I didn't, I still got disease. It's always possible. I think it's less likely, but it's always possible. We need to protect these birds at a mucosal level. Um, and that's kind of where I would leave it. Yeah, yeah, very good. Um, next question is, what is the effect of astro, astrovirus, astrovirus um, in gout problems, in laying uh, birds apart from the IB aspect and yeah, that, that's a good question. Uh, I, I really don't know exactly how common uh, astrovirus is in layers and, and how often it influences gout problems, but it brings up a, a good point in that gout is just a final outcome of uh, many possible uh, disease processes. It, uh, it may be the end of a bronchitis with certain strains. It could be from other viruses as well. It can be a feed issue. It can be where we are giving too much calcium to birds during the rearing period. It can be a calcium particle size issue where uh, young birds are getting large particle calcium and overdosing themselves on calcium and that's destroying the kidneys. We can have mycoplasma, or sorry, mycotoxin problems that uh, can result finally in, in gout. Um, and we can have management problems like uh, water problems that uh, uh, cause dehydration, damage the kidneys. Or we can have drinking water very high in minerals that are damaging the kidneys. So gout is a, a general condition and uh, caused by many potential problems in the field. I think uh, it's a situation where multiple uh, insults are occurring to the kidneys and causing damage. And so these problems are, are, are a bit difficult to uh, sort out um, uh, in the field. But one of the first ones to think about is the role of bronchitis. Uh, maybe in com combination with my mycotoxins. I think that's a, a, a likely scenario in, in uh, India. So the uh, next, uh, actually the next three questions, 
have to do with uh, antibiotic treatments and dosages and timings and uh, I'll I'll continue my uh, avoiding those questions now. So the last one is uh, apart from 3IB vaccinations within 28 days another killed vaccine will be effective? Yes or no? Um, I'm not totally sure what they're asking here. I'm going to guess that apart from doing our vaccine program in the first 28 days, having three times that we discussed, will adding in another killed vaccine later be effective? Um, and, and my response is yes. I mean, it's especially if you're going to boost up as you get closer into the laying period, we always want to keep going back to these things. I think part of the issue that we have with laying birds, laying hens, as compared to broilers, is the longevity that these birds are around. We're trying to keep these birds in production for you know, two years sometimes. And that being the case, we need to re-up, if you will, our immune system and its protection. And so boosting later on with a killed vaccine, and again with live vaccines, even going into the lay period in these high challenge areas can be a really effective part of your control program. Yeah, that, that's great comments. Uh... And I would say, you know, the, the, the way commercial egg production is going is that the, the genetics companies are all moving for layers that are going to lay longer, you know, before, you know, 70 weeks was a, a long lived bird. Now, you know, we're going to 100 weeks. And so in those situations, um, uh, we, we need to have reinforcing vaccinations, not only for bronchitis, but, but others as well. Uh, uh, if we have live vaccinations during the rearing period, uh, we should at a minimum have a killed vaccine at the point of lay. If we're not using the killed vaccine at a point of lay, we almost have to have a uh, live boosting program during the laying period. And as Seisha mentioned, there's situations where the challenge is high, the birds are going to be kept for a long time that we would utilize both a inactivated vaccine and a live boosting program during, during lay. So last question of the day. Last question of the day. If Newcastle vaccine and IV vaccine are given the same route within a week, does it compromise immunity of either one of them? If yes, what should be the gap uh, amongst them uh, or what would be the gap to keep them separate? Yeah, it, if you're using uh, single Newcastle vaccine and single bronchitis vaccine, you need to have at least a seven day gap between them. Uh, commercially, there are many, many uh, preparations uh, of Newcastle combined with bronchitis that have been balanced in the laboratory uh, so that they are not interfering with each other. So if it's a combination vaccine, great. Uh, if you're using uh, monovalent Newcastle and bronchitis, then a seven day minimum would be my, my recommendation. And I support that completely. And I'm gonna make it really clear because I've seen this stuff happen in the field. It has got to be a mixed vaccine coming from the company. If you take a strain of bronchitis and a strain of Newcastle and mix them and give them at the same time, that doesn't count. It's got to be the purchased preparation of the mixed where they've been balanced in the laboratory, like Doug said. Otherwise, you will have competition for uptake into those epithelial cells, and you'll have either a poor response to both, a poor response to one, potentially even a disease outbreak. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Doug and Sassy, for the wonderful session. Uh, thanks to all for participating. We'll have more such session, sessions going forward. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank thanks. you.